Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm Richard Lewis, I'll be talking about digital heritage, interpretation and engagements. Um, firstly, just a little about myself. I relatively recently completed my MA in public archaeology at UCL, uh, looking mostly at how digital technology can be used in developing and creating a dialogue with the public. Um, so this, this talk will be mostly centered around my dissertation, uh, Digital Dialogues, How Can Developing Digital Technology in the Year. Um, so my real aim, my real area of focus on this was um, smartphone and tablet apps. Uh, the major reason, firstly, because it is a growing, if not already grown, area of digital heritage interpretation. Lots of museums and uh, heritage organizations have apps and use apps regularly. Um, the other area, the other reason I wanted to look at apps is because it has a lot in com to compare with the wider app market. So there are lots of you know, gaming apps, language apps. And all sorts of education things going out there um, that you can compare directly with the existing heritage apps. Um, so I wanted to understand how apps are used for heritage interpretation. Everything that includes, so the different features of apps, so everything from very simplistic audio guides replace using new technology to reply, directly replace um, older technologies all the way up to some more complex things like augmented reality and um, AV um, methods. I then wanted to understand how these apps are being promoted. It's based on um, a theory that um, apps are, uh, heritage <coughs> apps are unpopular in comparison to the general app market and they're not being used, they're either, they're not being uh, taken up in the way that they should be and they're not, they may not be being used in the way that um, the uh, the audience are expecting of us. Um, and then I also wanted to understand just a little bit about how um, apps are used in order to create a dialogue specifically through social media integration. Um, okay, so the app that I looked at was the Stonehenge Audio Tour <coughs> app, uh, launched on 12th of December to go along with the opening of the Stonehenge Visitor Centre. Um, it is really just a very basic app. It's like the example of <coughs> it is just the movement from uh, the audio guide system straight to uh, an audio app. Um, and as such, the user interface is very basic. It's just a you hit a point, um, a number of points along the course of your visit, you press the audio recording and you listen to it in any way you would before. The purpose of this, the reason it was launched, as I found out from my research, was that um, the uh, Stone, Stonehenge people, they expected a massive um, influx of new visitors, obviously, because new, uh, new visitor centre. Um, and they knew that what they had in terms of infrastructure for audio guides at the time wasn't enough and they needed to increase it exponentially. This was seen as a sensible way of doing that, was relatively inexpensive for them, relatively easy to do. Um, yeah. So. Um, so, I had four basic aims for my investigation. Um, Personally, I wanted to understand how apps are being used at heritage sites. Like I say, audio guides are the, like the English Heritage um, Stonehenge app, the basic one. The English Heritage have a wide variety of different kinds of apps that are different um, interactive levels. And then all the way up to things like the Stream Museum Londinium app, which uh, by uh, Museum of London, which is a lot more, has a lot more interaction, a lot more video and audio. And plays in, people have seen that before. Um, I also wanted to understand how apps are promoted. That's everything from on-site promotion in terms of what is actually displayed, the kind of um, content and infrastructure that allows people to download and use apps at the site itself, and also um, the um, how um, apps are promoted online, both through social media channels, so which social media channels are being used and why, and also where on the main websites, the um, apps are being advertised, so either are they on the front page or are they at the, uh, the point where you pay for your tickets on the, um, for the site and does that affect the number of downloads. Um, I then wanted to understand how popular Heritage Apps are amongst the public. Um, this is really going on my own personal experience of finding people don't use apps, Heritage Apps as much as they would use a regular app and I wanted to understand why, what kind of apps they were using if they were using Heritage Apps. Um, and if there was a variation in terms of people, um, in terms of age and um, 
employment sites in terms of find, uh, well, and whether they can uh, are visiting multiple sites or if they're only visiting one site or so a year. Um, and then I wanted to understand just how all of this can be improved. So what can be added to the utility of an app? What is expected of, by the audience of heritage organizations um, to exist on, on apps? And also um, what can be done in terms of improving the promotion? Um, so I did three basic methods. Uh, initially I did a desk-based research um, survey which was to understand the um, current market. Um, that was really basically to understand what features are possible, what features are currently being used, um, how much these apps are actually being um, generally used. I then decided to compare this with two surveys, an online and an on-site survey. The online, I just took a, I, I created an online survey and spread it around my social media feeds and um, the on-site survey, I went to Stonehenge to the visitor center and I stood outside and I asked people to fill out a survey for several hours. That was fun. Um, so, <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't change this before I heard the first talk, so top-down versus grassroots initiatives are still in here. Um, but the reason I decided to look at these in comparison, basically, English Heritage, I kind, you can kind of see as a um, top-down, almost a top-down organization. It's a very massive organization that has historic, that now is including interaction with their public more, but is based around employment and ownership sites, and has a lot more has a lot more financial ability than smaller organisations. Um, so, those kind of organisations tend to have apps because they have more money. Now, there are lots of there are some examples of grassroots initiatives that want to develop apps and have been. Um, that is a relatively recent um, thing. So, in comparison, grassroots initiatives tend to be more social media. <coughs> Um, and what I wanted to what I wanted to see is if the theory and the the drive that um, creates social that creates uh, grassroots initiatives um, in terms of communicating with their public and actually having a really active dialogue with their public can be used for the um, for the benefit of top down. <coughs> um, so I split myself in twenty four basic twenty four simple questions. Um, split into these four sections. Basic information, obviously things like age and you know, general things. I wanted to know employment status is actually an important part for me because um, what I found was that online the majority of people that I surveyed were students or part-time employed. Um, whereas the people that I surveyed on site tend to be members of family groups and were either employed or retired. Um, and therefore had more money to spend and had often come from multiple sites as, a, as part of a wider tour. That um, in itself affects the kind of apps they choose to download and use. Um, I then questioned how they use, their, how they use social media, uh, what sites they're on, what kind of technologies they use. Um, basically in order to know where my audience is, where the, um, so where the best um, areas of promotion can be. Um, uh, and also how they use their digital technology. So if they're walking around with a smartphone or an iPad the entire time um, they're on sites, whether these are the kinds of tools that should be used um, in terms of heritage interpretation. Um, I then looked at non-specific apps just to kind of get an idea of how they use um, apps generally, how often they're using them was a key feature, how often they're deleting them, how often they're re-downloading them, um, the kind of just <coughs> the way they're using their apps. And then comparing all of this data to basically the same questions for the, smart, uh, for the heritage apps and seeing if they correlated and if they didn't, uh, why. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of questions now just to highlight some of my key findings. Um, firstly, approximately how many heritage apps do you have on your smartphone? What I found from this was um, most people really only have between one and two. Um, which I should have changed. I didn't get a chance. I used my survey, I said one to nine, and I was a bit optimistic. Um, <laughs> um, what I did find was the people online tended to have significantly more heritage apps. They actually did have between uh, one to five on average, whereas the people on site only had between one and two. And the reason for this, I find out, is actually that the majority of online apps, the online users are using apps that are single site based, and therefore they use multiple apps um, for multiple sites. 
Whereas on site, they're using one massive app that gives them the key information they, they want to find out from multiple sites as part of the day out or a week of um, tourism. Um, so I then wanted to find out how frequently the apps are being used. Um, missing a word there. That should say monthly at the end of apps, sorry. Um, but what it basically, what I found out here is um, it supports my initial assertion, which is that 50% um, of people are using um, online, uh, on site, are using their apps monthly, whereas the majority, which is 35% of, um, of online people, are only using them yearly. This says, this shows that they're using, they're going to one site a year, um, or well, they're going to the site once a year and then using it once when they're there, and mostly that they're using the app. Whereas the people on site are using things like the English Heritage Days Out app or the National Trust app, which allow them to get information about opening times and prices and events. Um, so it's got a lot more utility. Um, I then looked at, I asked people if they'd actually heard of or downloaded the app. Um, this was quite interesting. Basically, 25, I mean, overall, these percentages are really, really low. Especially for Stonehenge, where there is actually a great big sign that says download our <laughs> um, But only 25% of the people had actually heard of it on site, um, which is still more, you know, massive compared to the online people, but okay. Um, what I found out from this was that even though the majority, like 25% of people are using the, uh, find, are known about the app, that only 2.8% of them are downloading it, um, which is. Um, I mean, there could be multiple reasons for this, although, to be perfectly honest, the major reason for this on that particular day was the Wi-Fi wasn't working, so no one could download it. Um, which is poor in itself, but the idea that Wi-Fi, that it's, you know, it seems simple, but having something that basic there allows people to actually use the app, otherwise the app becomes completely pointless, and the whole idea of the app and helping your infrastructure um, becomes completely redundant. Um, and then one graph, because I think we're doing it, which is basically um, most people, if they haven't downloaded heritage apps, why? Um, this other section here on the online, I did these surveys first, so I, hadn't, I changed it by the time I came to the on-site and asked people directly, but the other, almost all of them said that they hadn't been aware of heritage apps. Um, <coughs> on both, both groups. Um, <coughs> that to me really shows the big, is the biggest indicator of why people don't load, download heritage apps because they're not aware of them. Um, there were, one, when I got a chance to speak face to face with people afterwards, one or two people, I did ask them, you know, would they download heritage apps if, they, um, if they're aware of them. Most said yes, some, some said no, they prefer different methods of um, site interpretation, but I mean, the, the very fact that, you know, the, the massive majority of people didn't know Heritage Apps exists is the reason why Heritage Apps aren't being downloaded. Um, so, I just got a couple, I just want to point out a couple of my hypotheses that I came across. Um, yeah, so, basically, um, first hypothesis, basically, participation in digital heritage interpretation is reliant on active communication by heritage organizations. Making people aware that these um, interpretation tools exist and you're using them is the really the only way you're going to get people to start using them in the first place. If they're not aware that heritage apps exist, then you've got no chance of doing getting people to use them. And if you if you're not getting people to use them, then what's the point of investing all that money, time, and effort into in that kind of interpretation tool? <coughs> um, other uh, hypothesis too is also the more content you have, the more um, they'll be used, not necessarily in terms of um, act, like single site active uh, use, but more in terms of um, cater to the market you're looking for, which is multiple sites, multiple visits, days out, tourism. Um, the little bit there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the other um, theory I came behind this was basically when I was doing my research, I found that the biggest uh, market right now for apps by a long way is gaming apps. Um, but there is a trend, a growing trend in general apps, especially lear learning apps, um, for uh, game-based features in apps. So things like the Duolingo uh, language app is an educational app, but it is, is based around uh, gaming points and lives and 
So everything you expect from that, and it's become wildly popular despite <coughs> it just being an edu uh, essentially an educational tool. Um, so that, you know, my, my theory that maybe that is a way to start looking at heritage apps to try and make them more, um, more interactive, more frequently used in gaming systems. Um, so final conclusions. Um, firstly, find out which websites your users are, uh, are on. Um, so which social media sites really, if they're on Facebook and they're only advertising on Twitter, you're not going to get anyone uh, downloading your site, uh, downloading your apps. If you, um, <coughs> then advertise prominently on the main website. Um, basically, when I, I think it's, it has changed now, but when I was on, when I was doing my research, the app itself was only available, was only being advertised at the point where you buy tickets and it was one small um, uh, word check link to the app store. Um, it is a bit better now, but it still requires some searching. You need to put in some <coughs> spaces for them to actually want to do it. Um, then advertise prominently on sites, obviously, but that needs to go in collaboration with access to things like Wi-Fi and, although they're kind of maybe not that great now, QR codes as well, or in easy access uh, codes. And then finally, just increase utility um, of the apps, multiple sites, multiple use, um, give people a reason to want to go on the app regularly, not once when they're only on the site. Um, that's it. Um, thank you. <laughs>